an animated series 3,500 years in the making with a director too young to know the meaning of impossible, a story about martial arts masters banded together like rigor mortis Power Rangers, a show infused with the spirits of those that came before. Hi, I'm Dan Larson, and this is the History of Mummies Alive. Thank you to Magic Spoon for sponsoring this video. Click the link in the description below and use code TOYGALAXY for $5 off your order today. There's a lot of things about being an adult that they don't tell you as a kid. Things you have to find out for yourself. One, casual Friday only applies to the dress code, not how long your shift is. Two, a ride in the car will make you sleepy even if you're driving. Three, cereal isn't supposed to be fun. Magic Spoon is here to help with at least one of those. It's all the same breakfast fun flavor and experience you had when you were a kid, but made with the stuff that adults approve of. In this example, you are the adult. Because Magic Spoon has zero grams of sugar, 13 to 14 grams of protein, and only four to five net grams of carbs in each serving, just 140 calories, it's keto-friendly, gluten-free, grain-free, and soy-free. Magic Spoon is so confident in their product, it's backed with a 100% happiness guarantee, so if you don't like it for any reason, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. And don't forget, Magic Spoon ships to Canada and the UK. Click the link below and use my code TOYGALAXY for $5 off your very own variety box and choose from Magic Spoon's best-selling flavors like birthday cake, blueberry muffin, and my favorite, fruity. You can also add the cookies and cream and cocoa peanut butter flavor cereal bars to your variety box. That's magicspoon.com slash toygalaxy to save $5 off your order today, and thanks again to Magic Spoon. Mummies Alive is an animated series that ran one season of 42 episodes from September to November of 1997, produced by Deke Entertainment in partnership with Ivan Reitman. It's the spiritual successor to the real Ghostbusters, except in this case, the ghosts are the good guys. Presley Carnivan is a kid who recently found out a secret. He was once a pharaoh in the time where Egyptians ruled the world. Or rather, he's the reincarnation of the spirit of Prince Rapses from the time when Egyptians ruled the world. See, thousands of years ago, the evil sorcerer Scarab killed Prince Rapses, son of the then pharaoh Amenhotep, imbuing Scarab with what he thought was everlasting life. Unfortunately for him, good for everyone else, Scarab was locked away in a tomb for nearly 3,500 years and his power began to wane. Accidentally released and revived, he is back on the streets today in San Francisco, searching day and night for the new Rapses so that he may once again consume his life force and finally become truly immortal. But Rapses, uh, Presley, has four guardians to protect his very life, mummies from 1525 BC. They are four guardians living life after death with the ability to summon even greater powers in the fight against evil. When each of the guardians speak the words with the strength of Ra, they become even stronger and protected by shining gold armor. Jakal is the leader with the power of the falcon. Wrath is the smart one with the power of the snake. Armin is the tough one with the power of the ram. Nefertina is the girl one with the power of the cat. But Scarab can summon additional power as well, transforming himself into a super-powered armored beetle form that allows him to fly while he commands an army of mindless constructs called Shabti. He's waited thousands of years to achieve immortality, now is his chance to finish the job. Nothing can stand in his way except the mummies. Hanging by the Frisco Bay, mummies, they're gonna save the world of today the Egyptian way. They're mummies alive. In 1995, Deke Animation head Andy Hayward took his family on vacation. Part of their trip was a stop at the British Museum in London, England, where the whole family took in the spectacle of a newly curated exhibit focused on ancient Egypt, specifically mummies. According to Joy Tashjin, then president of Worldwide Merchandising and Sales at Deke, Hayward's kids, quote, went crazy over the mummies. Hayward knew that if his kids were into mummies, then perhaps other kids would be too. Ancient Egypt and mummies as pop culture characters were back in vogue in the 90s thanks to several factors. Factors that were different from their rise in popularity during the 80s thanks to MTV and the Bangles song Walk Like an Egyptian. Despite the fact that x-rays and cat scans had been in use to examine mummies since the 70s, technology had finally reached a point in the early 90s where file sizes were small enough and resolution was high enough to make it an effective tool in the study of mummification, prompting researchers to revisit historic discoveries of the past. On top of that, an incredible sight of 252,000 year old mummies in mint condition called the Valley of the Golden Mummies made headlines in 1996. That discovery and subsequent analysis helped broaden the understanding of the process while inspiring new questions about the religious and cultural significance of the procedures, and it made for great TV when unboxings were broadcast. 
The 1993 Goosebumps book The Curse of the Mummy's Tomb and its 1994 sequel Return of the Mummy introduced Prince Koru, who would go on to be featured on a variety of Goosebumps licensed merchandise, and Legend of the Lost Tomb starring Stacey Keach and Rick Rossovich aired on Showtime in 1997. And it was likely the 1995 Shaw and Nicholson exhibit at the British Museum that set Hayward and his children's imaginations on fire, artifacts that were showcased in conjunction with the publication of The Dictionary of Ancient Egypt, written by Ian Shaw and Paul Nicholson to establish uniform English terminology for the study of ancient Egypt and related artifacts. But all that aside, the real reason the exhibit got Deke head Andy Hayward so excited was that it was the pitch that finally reunited Deke with longtime production partner Ivan Reitman. See. Back in 1984, Reitman's Ghostbusters movie kicked off a licensing empire that yielded merchandise across the spectrum and made a lot of people a lot of money. Deke was one of the beneficiaries of Ghostbusters' success, and since the end of Deke's The Real Ghostbusters cartoon in 1991 after 141 episodes, they had been working to find a new project to reincarnate that magic. Mummies was the pitch that Reitman finally agreed to. Reitman wasn't an easy sell. What closed the deal was Reitman experiencing the same excitement that Hayward experienced. In 1996, Hayward brought Reitman and his kids to a similar mummy exhibit in Los Angeles, at which point they too went crazy over the mummies. Deke finally had a production partner with Reitman, Hasbro signed on as their toy partner, they were already shopping the project to networks, the last thing they had to do was make the show. Mummies alive! We're unwrapping for action, and you gotta be there! We've got ancient magic, and great powers. But the fun is all new, and so is the action. You haven't seen anything like it for 3,500 years. Weekdays right here on this station. Mummies alive! Weekday mornings at 8, only on UPN 38. In 1996, Seth Kearsley was fresh out of Cal Arts, just beginning his career in animation. At 23, he had already worked as a production artist on The Max and The Simpsons. He was working for Disney when he got the call for a potential producer-director job. According to Kearsley, he'd never even been employed as a full-time board artist, so he didn't think there was a chance in hell he would get a showrunner gig. But he met with the head of development at Deke, who outlined a hellish schedule. 42 half-hour episodes in a year and a half, launching two a week until about halfway through when it would increase to three a week. One director. Kearsley knew how pre-production worked, but not coordinating with a Korean studio. He understood making a show in theory, but had no idea how difficult it was actually going to be. They asked him if he could do it, and he said yes, assuming that if he failed, they would have no one to blame but themselves. To Kearsley's disbelief, Deke called his bluff and he threw himself into the fire, making mistakes, learning as he went, living at the studio, leaning on the veterans that were brought in to get the show made. Kearsley was surrounded by a team that were fans of 80s cartoons, things like Thundercats and Silverhawks. They wanted to make that kind of show. As he put it, the show we would have sat watching on a Saturday morning with a bowl full of sugary cereal. Heck, two of the writers, Eric and Julia Lewald, were fresh off their run with Disney's Gargoyles animated series, bringing over their hyper-specific experience writing for a show about supernatural guardians from the past, reawakened in modern times, who use their everlasting undeath to foil the attempts of an evildoer to achieve the same level of immortality. Mummies Alive featured Dale Wilson as the voice of Jakal, Scott McNeil as Wrath, Graham Kingston as Armin, and Cree Summer as Nefertina. Gerard Plunkett countered them each week as the voice of Scarab. Kearsley's desire to get the band Gravity Kills to write a theme song for the series was overruled even though they actually cut a demo. Instead, Deke brought in Ron Wasserman, the same Ron Wasserman who composed the theme song for the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. The hellish schedule proved to be no match for the youthful determination of Kearsley and team. All 42 episodes of Mummies Alive were distributed through Claster Television and aired weekdays on the WB, UPN, and Fox affiliates throughout the U.S. between September and November of 1997. Unfortunately, the ratings did not meet the standard of crazy over the mummies that networks were hoping for. 42 episodes was far short of recapturing that Ghostbusters magic, prematurely ending plans for a second season. That said, Mummies Alive took on a second life after death, rebroadcast as part of the Bobot Kids Network into the year 2000, and returned again in 2004 on the Deke Kids Network block. 
Mummies Alive was produced in partnership with Hasbro, who released a full complement of 5-inch action figures and vehicles under their Kenner branding. Wave 1 included Jakal, Armin, Scarab, each with power-up armor, and a Shabti trooper with a firing javelin missile. Carrying on the spirit of Kenner's real Ghostbusters toys from the 80s were Fright Features or Fright Sight versions of Jakal and Wrath. Similar to their Ghostbusters counterparts, they appear to be normal facing figures, but squeeze their legs and a mechanism triggers a scary face reveal. Vehicles included the Hot Ra, which Kearsley says was inspired by Hasbro's G.I. Joe Ram motorcycle, a favorite of his when he was a kid, the Nihilator jet cycle, and the Skycophagus. Bravo to the folks who picked the names. If there's one thing we respect around here, it's commitment to the bit. <laughs> A second series of figures was only released in the UK and parts of Europe after the show was cancelled, making them much harder to find. Wave 2 included Nefertina and Presley, who were left out of Wave 1, a Fright Sight version of Armin. Other figures like Fright Sight Scarab and Wrath were planned, but never released. If you missed Mummies Alive back in the 90s, the first three episodes were released as a movie called The Legend Begins on VHS in 1998. The first four episodes were released on VHS and DVD in 2001, and again in 2003, you can stream all 42 episodes online from various services, or the first 18 episodes from Wild Brain officially here on YouTube. In September of 2022, Mummies Alive producer and director Seth Kearsley posted a video to his YouTube channel reflecting on the 25th anniversary of the series. Since he worked on Mummies Alive, he's been leveling up, directing feature films like Adam Sandler's Eight Crazy Nights in 2002 and TV series like Take Two with Phineas and Ferb in 2011. In fact, many of the young talents that helped bring Mummies Alive to life have moved on to become showrunners, writers, and producers in their own right. But the thing that stands out for Kearsley and his time on Mummies Alive are the fans that have continued to cherish the show long after its cancellation. Should the opportunity ever come up, he would love to revisit and reboot, roll in some computer-generated graphics to give it a tuned style, but still be able to do more dynamic camera movement. But it's out of his hands, and he has no idea who actually has the rights. Could be Wild Brain, could be Disney, could be Hasbro, could be the Montecito picture company owned by the late Ivan Reitman's son, Jason. Could be you. Kearsley says in his video that if he were to hear someone propose a schedule today similar to the one they executed for Mummies Alive, 42 half-hour episodes in a year and a half, he would think they were crazy. And he would say there's no way that can be done. No way. Not this time. No. Not this time. Pure fiction. It's fiction. It's fiction. No way. Not a chance. Not this time. It's an urban legend that never happened. Perhaps that's the wisdom of age talking, the hard-earned value of experience working within the system, but it was magic that brought the mummies to life in the first place, and it would be magic to bring them back again today. Or perhaps a young animator crazy over the mummies who doesn't know the meaning of impossible. Thanks for watching. Please hit like, hit subscribe if you're not already a subscriber. Thank you very much to those of you who already are. If you're in the position to help the channel grow, if you would like early access to the videos ad-free as well as behind-the-scenes features, sneak peeks at upcoming projects, and exclusive monthly podcasts about the show, please visit our Patreon at patreon.com slash toygalaxy and let us know in the comments down below if you've ever even heard of Mummies Alive. You have now. I admit that if it weren't for people asking us to cover this series over the years, I might not have known it existed myself, but I will also admit that I was actually pleasantly surprised by the quality of the animation and how much it played as a straight-up superhero TV series. I don't know what I was expecting. Night at the Museum? Brendan Fraser's The Mummy? Tom Cruise's The Mummy? Probably something closer to The Scorpion King, but the one at the end of The Mummy Returns, the CGI thing? I can honestly say Mummy's Alive is better than that. Cut.